Hello, and welcome to the Fossil Record. That sounds like some kind of music record, doesn't it? Well, like the rock record, the fossil record is something tangible. It's something that we find out in the field, out in nature. And I thought I'd start this journey by showing you some examples of what that looks like. So you will have a feel for how people find fossils in the fossil record. Before I show you that information, I want to be clear that when it comes to collection of fossils, that you need to do it in a legal manner. If you are unfamiliar with that, by this point in the semester, you need to revisit the PERPA Casual Collecting Lab, and you should do your own research on what is allowable to collect when you're not on your own private property. So a few things about fossils that you might find in your private property. If you ever find human remains, you don't have a choice. You must call them in. So you would want to pick up the phone and call the authorities. I don't care if it is 10 million years old. Probably wouldn't be that old with humans. If it would, it'd be the most stunning fossil discovery ever for hominids. But maybe you could find something that is several hundred thousand years old. You still need to call the authorities. The same is true as if you find modern human remains. I know that seems obvious, but that is something that I have come across when students have asked me about the what ifs questions. If you find other fossils, let's say you find a mammoth fossil on your property, well, good for you. It's on your property, you own it. The government can't come in and eminent domain that. What they would likely do is if you told someone is try to buy your property if it was that significant. So don't worry about someone trying to take your property for that. Gets a little trickier when you find something like a whole village of artifacts from Native Americans. So I'm not saying that eminent domain would be a part of that. I'm just letting you know that these are very important finds. Not that fossils are not, they are. So to differentiate between fossils and archaeology, we are looking at human artifacts when we're talking about archaeology. There is some crossover with fossils, obviously, if you're dealing with hominid fossils. So when we're talking about the fossil record in general, we're li literally referring to the millions, actually billions of years of fossils that have been recorded that means buried and captured in rock. So as we get started, I'm going to kind of talk about what you're fixing to see and explain why it's important. So let's get started with you understanding the fossil record. So you'll hear some drilling in the background and I want to tell you you're at a dig site here. I will tell you it's in Utah. It's a legal dig and it was run by a museum of natural history from another university. We were invited to participate in this dig, so it's completely legal. Everything that's been found here was given to the Museum of Natural History as part of our class. So this tool right here is a pneumatic tool, and you'll see one of my students using it in a minute. And all the random tools you see are parts of a natural dig site. This individual student went to this very institution that you're taking this class from, and you can see that he's using that pneumatic tool to unearth sediments. And the reason he's doing that is we don't want to take a pickaxe or some kind of damaging tool and actually hit a bone and destroy it. There's so many bones that are in this area that it is such a story to tell. Now I'm fixing to show you what some of those bones look like. This is one right here. Here are some right here and you might wonder what are they of? They just look like rock. Well they've been permanentalized and that's exactly what they are. But they're parts of sauropod dinosaurs from the late uh, Jurassic period. So all these tools you see here are definitely part of a normal dig site. This is actually a glue material that you would put on fossils in order to keep them intact. And then you see the substrate itself and you can see that it's not that loose. Why you have brushes, why you have mats, you have shovels to get the material out. The, the glue, the paleo bond. 
So we're now going to look at another site and show you the difference between this one and a different type of substrate. So you are looking at a group of students overseen by a very renowned uh, paleontologist who is actually from Germany and this particular college is working with ours and we used to go on dinosaur digs. You can hear them talking because they're jacketing a fossil in the field. And this jacketing process uh, is very tedious and you might wonder why do we do that. You do it so you can get the fossils back to a laboratory to study. Hopefully they don't disintegrate. Well, most fossils are not durable and they will disintegrate and fall into pieces. And since most fossils are not found articulated together, we have to kind of piece together what we find in the field. So when you find fossils that are articulated, that's like a huge deal. You can bet you they will all be documented. They will all be uh, mapped out in terms of where they were found because the location, the angle of the beds and so forth, it all matters. So that's, uh, that's Axel right there. He's, a, he's something else. He's, but I'm telling you, he's one of the best uh, paleontologists I've ever met. And when you're watching these students do that, I just want to tell you that these bones were fairly rare. They didn't happen very frequently in nature. And so we're looking at what's called a death assemblage of fossils, which you'll learn about later. So more to come as we get into fossils that kind of give you flavor about the fossil record. So I just showed you two legal authorized dig sites of two very different types of fossils, both inver involving vertebrates. We did find invertebrates at both. However, we had permission to do that. So I want to really caution you that what you saw is not something that you should duplicate without the proper permits and authorization. Just flat out, if you're extracting vertebrate fossils from the ground on public lands of any sort, you're going to need a permit to do so. That is not authorized. You have got to get the proper authorization. So you learned about that in casual collecting and I'm holding you to understanding that the purple rules apply. There are rules for artifacts as well under ARPA. So be careful what you collect because you may actually be breaking the law. So let's now talk about the fossil record and how those two sites were special and how they differ from like the one that this fossil came from right here. We have to start with what the definition of a fossil is. The fossil record encompasses organisms that were once alive and they have died and been buried in the substrate. In other words, they've been preserved in rock. So they were once living. We can also have fossils that were evidence of these once living organisms. They still qualify as fossils. The key is they must be more than 10,000 years old. Why that magic number? Well, if they're 9,999 years, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds, does that disqualify them from a fossil? No. We are looking at a basic timeline that is in conjunction with the geologic time scale. So if you'll get out your geologic time scale and you look towards the very top in the quaternary period, you will see the out of all of the epics that are listed there, you will see the very uh, top one is the Holocene. The Holocene marks the last 10,000 years of time. That's why there's a dividing marker for what is a fossil or not a fossil. So that Holocene moment matters. So could you have something that's ancient, that's found in rock, that's less than 10,000 years of age? Yes. And there are some scientists that might actually qualify that as a fossil. For the sake of our course, we're just going to draw that line in the sand and say 10,000 years and older. Most of the stuff that's younger than that hasn't even been preserved in rock yet. So it could be, I'm not saying it wouldn't be, but oftentimes it's not. So what you see these two pictures here, these are modern shells. And I actually legally collected these off of a beach. And they aren't old enough to be fossils. They don't qualify, but they might be in a million years especially if they got buried in a rock layer where we could get some contextual information about it. 
What's one of the most important concepts about the fossil record is how limited our fossil record is. About 1% of ancient organisms over the entire geologic time we've had life has been preserved. So if someone were to tell you that the fossil record is complete, that's hogwash. It's not true. There's no way we can know exactly what all lived. We wish we could. Every scientist that studies fossils wants to know everything that lived. So when you're thinking about fossils, the first question you have to ask yourself, is it a fossil, meaning has it, is it an age that qualifies? So it's older than Holocene. In other words, older than 10,000 years of age. There's another concept with fossils that's super important something called index fossils. This is an index fossil. It's a type of ammonite. And this special type of ammonite actually is found in a specific type of rock layer, actually from Morocco. And uh, when you look at this, you'll notice that they're fairly famous and you see a bunch of them around for sale, if you want to put it that way, because they're so beautiful. Well, index fossils may not be beautiful, but they have a couple of requirements that make them important. First off, they are restricted to a narrow range of time. That means they were in existence during that time, which is the next requirement, widely distributed during that time, and easily recognizable. That's the third part. So one, they are restricted to a narrow window of time. They were lots of them, for a short period of time geologically, making them excellent markers. And then third, you can easily recognize them across the world. So we call these things index fossils. So they kind of work like musicians are really fancy cars. Like my mom had a 66 GTO. Now that was a hot rod car, had a massive engine. And this is in the day when we had full service stations. So everybody wanted to look under our hood. If you saw one of those out today, that would be considered an index car. It'd be like an index fossil, <laughs> except it's not old enough, obviously. But it's a classic, right? It is one of those muscle cars that stands out. If you were to put a certain Corvette out there from one of the original years, that would be a classic. If you would put a Model A Ford, that would be a classic car that people would recognize. You put a Lamborghini, it's one of its uh, a unique thing. So index fossils are special like that. Maybe for you singers and music, you'd relate to Frank Sinatra or you'd relate to ZZ Top or ACDC or you'd re, uh, recognize some other singer from a more modern time. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that you can recognize the time that these people went with, right? And that's how index fossils work as well. So we use index fossils to do the law of faunal succession because these markers are in the rock record in sequential layers and we can see them for a while and then they just poof, they disappear. So that's the importance of understanding index fossils. All right, how do fossils even form? So let me tell you what you're looking at here. That dinosaur dig I showed you that was in the harder rock that was kind of this color right here. This is a, an armor plate and it came out of an ancient vertebrate, either from an adiosaur or a phytosaur, which are two very different types of, of reptiles. They're not dinosaurs, but they are very special to that time. So they're like index fossils for that time. Now, the process of preserving life is pretty remarkable. So fossilization is that process of burying and preserving ancient parts. And it could be a shell, it could be a tooth, it could be even a cast or a mold, a different type of trace fossil, or it could be something as cool as an armor plate, which would be like the armor on top of a crocodile today. But the fossil record does not contain a complete record of everything. If it did, every fossil in a museum would be 100% complete. That is just not the case. Most of those are filled in cast of what we have from other organisms that may have not matched that specific animal. Sometimes they're a guess. So we don't have a complete fossil record. But when we do get a fossil, especially a vertebrate one, it's a big deal. Not that invertebrates aren't, because there's a bunch of them and they tell a wonderful story. So how do things get fossilized? 
There's multiple steps, but typically the first step requires something like this. Burial fast. And the fastest way to bury something that's died is in water. That may seem backwards, but when you get a marine setting like this, it's going to fall to the bottom and it's going to get buried pretty quickly. That's why we have so many more marine invertebrate fossils than we do of any other sort. So if I get an animal that dies on land, we have some challenges. We could get some scavenging. We could get some weathering. We could get some things taken away altogether just by other means of natural uh, fluvial transportation, wind, uh, you name it. It could be broken up by a rock that falls on it. So to preserve fossils that are on land, there's it's more tricky. It's uh, harder to do. But when you have an environment like a swamp, the ocean, a lake, there's a higher probability these things will get to, to actually be buried. Once they're buried, they it limits the decay of the animal. So it's very rare that we actually get the soft body parts of animals preserved. But if we can even preserve just the exterior or a shell or a bone, that's a pretty remarkable process. So there's a higher chance of fossilization when a large number of specific group of organisms existed during that isolated geologic time, kind of like an index fossil. And the organism lived around sediment for rapid burial. So this is a crinoid fossil, which is an index fossil during the late Paleozoic era, right around the Mississippian period. Well, these things were everywhere in the fossil record. I mean, lots of them. And then most of them of this particular sort go belly up and they get missing out of the rock record pretty quickly. So in order to have this happen, to have so many fossils of this type, we would have had to bury them pretty quickly. Otherwise, they really didn't stand a chance of being preserved. And I think that's the challenge of us wrapping our brains around why only 1% of probably everything that's been out there has been preserved. So there are probably organisms we've never even heard of or discovered yet that might have a fossil on Earth, or it may not even have one. That's why when you see these discoveries, like the ones I showed you up at the very beginning of the lecture, they're important because they help fill in the gaps that we have in our knowledge base about fossils. There are four groups of fossils that we look for in the rock record. The first one are vertebrates. These have backbones. So they're going to be from Kingdom Animalia. Then you get invertebrates. And folks, there are so many more invertebrates as compared to vertebrates. A majority of the fossil record is made up of between verte invertebrates and plants. So we see lots of plants, and the process for getting them to be preserved is pretty remarkable. they got to be buried pretty quick. But you can't discount the microscopic organisms. They make up so much of the fossil record and play a huge important role in even things like the generation of fossil fuels. So this would be a vertebrate right here. This is a mosasaur jawbone. This is an invertebrate of a bivalve, or really a palesopod, which is in the phylum mollusca. This is a plant, and then this is a microscopic uh, foraminifera. And so while it looks like the same size as these, this thing required a scanning electron microscope, the one on the far right, to be zoomed in. And it's just a fraction of the size of one strand of hair, if that. I mean, it's such a tiny little thing. But we find literally billions and zillions of these things on certain rock records in, in just one little thin square inch. So there are lots of microscopic organisms out there to study. So what's the most common types of fossils? There's two, invertebrates like my shell here, and then plant fossils. So this is part of a tree that lived during the Paleozoic era and then went extinct. We never see it again. So if we find fossils, we're just going to restrict them for plants to kingdom plantae, but when it comes to kingdom animalia, we're going to start getting into the phylums. There are multiple domains of which are in your book, and each of them could potentially have fossils. So just making you aware that we're really going to focus on kingdom animalia, but that's not all that the fossil record has to hold. The first phylum is phylum Annelida. Annelida are going to include things like worms. 
And we have worm fossils, worm furrows, such as these. These are like worm burrows right here. Even these little things are. While we may not have the soft parts of most worms, we certainly have evidence that they've been around from the Precambrian all the way to present. I want to point out the geologic range is important for testing purposes because the most fossils appeared in the next time frame, which will be in the Phanerozoic eon, not the Precambrian, and they started, and most of them, in the Cambrian. Only one or two start in the Ordovician, so you need to know this. All right, phylum arthropoda. Arthropods are invertebrates that are segmented, meaning they have segmented bodies, so I put two out here for you of my specimens. So this is a trilobite. Isn't he cute? He has little eyes right here. This is his shield of a head. Then he has his thorax and then his little rear end down here. He's three parts. That's why he's called trilobite. You can see that you got a crab over here. You can see his segmented body. These kinds of fossils exist from the Cambrian all the way to present. Now I'm not saying the fossils you see here are present today. They're not. They've been extinct for some time. But these are just examples that we even have these kinds of things today. This guy looks like a roly-poly bug, but this one lived in, in water, predominantly the ocean. And you know we have these if you like king crab. This is a much smaller version, obviously. So a famous index fossil for arthropods would be trilobites. Brachiopoda. One thing about brachiopods, and I'm going to show you this up front to make your life easier when you get to lab. Notice that if I took and divided this shell directly in half, right down from here all the way straight up, it would have two mirror sides on either direction. That's one way we differentiate a brachiopod from something like a bivalve or palespod from a mollusk. Those are types of mollusks. We'll get to them in a minute. The common names for brachiopods are called lamp, and the reason they're called lamp shells is because they kind of look like a lampshade, and not all of them do, but certainly many of them do. They started appearing in the fossil record from the Cambrian period, which is the very beginning of the Phanerozoic eon, all the way to modern day. Phylum Bryozoa of Kingdom Animalia, these include the sea mosses. The sea mosses are two varieties. One come in the encrusting type, which would be this stuff right here. So they make basically layers of encrusting mats on top of rock strata and sediment. And then we get the branching one, like you see this cute little Archimedes right here. It looks like a screw. Nevertheless, bryozoans did not start appearing until the Ordovician, but they still exist today. The fossils you see here have gone extinct. They're actually index fossils for their time. So when you think about bryozoans, I'd just like you to remember that they were filter feeders, and they had a role in something like a coral reef. Bryozoans help clean uh, water along with other types of organisms. This is phylum chordata. You're a part of phylum chordata. So is this really interesting guy over here to the right. He's called a placoderm. So if I could give you a size, this would be something like the size of a car door. The head is. And you're going to go, whoa, that's big. I took this uh, picture at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. So this is a moment that I should take to talk about how organisms develop over time. Chordata, in particular, the organisms, vertebrates, started off as very simplistic in the Cambrian period. Over time, we became more complex. So like the placoderm was pretty common in the Devonian. So it goes Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. Mississippian, Pennsylvania, and then we get into the dinosaur time frame of Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Then we get into the Paleogene and the Neogene and the Cenozoic. So you and I exist in the Quaternary, which is the very top period of the geologic time scale. So over geologic time, the rock record and fossil records show that there is a gradual change of simplistic animals to more complex animals. So that may hit a nerve with some people when you hear that. I'm just going on what my experience is and what the fossil record shows. You still have your own choice to believe how you do about how animals formed and when they formed. 
For this class, you need to know that we do have documented evidence in the fossil and rock record that strongly suggest and support that there was an evolution of time that changed these organisms from simplistic to more complex. Well, that brings us to phylum Cnidaria. Cnidarians are organisms that are invertebrates that have stinging nematocysts. Essentially, they include things like corals. So corals are different from bryozoans and from sponges in a minute that we'll learn about that are called periphera. And they are different because they contain these openings where individual polyps of corals live. These are called coralites. That's what these little individual cavities are all the way around this, root, uh, this particular coral, which is called a rugos coral. So you have a fairly complex animal where they will zap something and sting it and eat it. So some corals can sting humans. I can personally attest to that from scuba diving and having brushed up against fire coral, which is not good diving habits anyway, I might share, but nevertheless, it happened. But most of the time, corals are just going to be grabbing microscopic or really tiny material out of water. So a coral reef, if it gets smothered by sediment or algae, it's not going to exist. And that's one thing that can kill off corals. Echina dermata. Let's break this term down. This phylum of kingdom animalia is one of my personal favorites. Echino means spiny. Dermata means skin. So e echinoderms, that's what we call them for short, echinoderms, are those things that have five-fold symmetry like a sand dollar. And second of all, they are things that are filter feeders. So here's my crinoid again. So relative to the crinoids might be um, basket stars, those kinds of things. And then you get this cute little dude. This is a blastoid. It's a cousin of our crinoid. And he had a little stalk and he filter fed out of the water. And then here are some sea urchins. Many sea urchins have bumps on them from where their little spines used to be or spicules. And most sea urchins eat sand and they're eating the algae off of the sand. So it's important to have these in your coral reef environment or else it can get really mucky and gross. By the flip side is you have too many of a good thing, it can also make the whole ecosystem kind of fail. So we started seeing echinoderms during the Cambrian and we have them all the way to modern day, of course. But all echinoderms are marine. I want you to take away that thought today. And all of them have five-fold symmetry. So mollusk, mollusca. This is one of the most diverse phylums out there. There are multiple varieties of phylum mollusca. So I'm only going to ask that you know three. And then if you get into geology and become a major and have to take invertebrate paleontology, get ready. There's a, just a slew of these guys to learn. The first one is bivalve. So we're going to encompass things like pelecipods, which actually is this dude right here, clamshells. So you might think about oysters. They are bivalves. The reason that bivalves are not the same as brachiopods is if you divide their shell on each side, they do not have mirror image. So that doesn't mean that both sides wouldn't fit together. It means that the top, if you look at their shell, it's not going to divide equally on, and be the same on both sides. Cephalopods so are uh, very famous. So these guys are coiling most of the time, not always. Some of them are non-coiling cephalopods. I remember the C for cinnamon buns. That's how I remember cephalopods. This is a cephalopod known as an ammonite. Then the gastropods, here's some great turatellas right here. They coil upwards. Some of them have a cinnamon bun looking appearance, but they always kind of have a three-dimensional upward appearance. And so a famous index fossil of phylum mollusca would be probably an ammonite. They're some of the most famous out there. So I wanted you to know that we started seeing these in mass quantities starting in the Cambrian, and we have them all the way today. 
But each of the creatures you see listed here, the photographs, they're extinct. There are no more of these particular species alive. So we can see that not just in where I'm filming this in the rocks in Texas or in New Mexico or in Kansas or even in Montana or Maine, we can see it across the world in Australia, in England, Scotland, Wales, Africa, Antarctica, Greenland. My point is they're worldwide. So when we start to see organisms disappear, they disappear worldwide. So now that brings us to phylum periphera. This is a really fascinating group within Kingdom Animalia. This includes your sponges. So sponges contain larger holes than bryozoans and then corals. And one reason is they need that to pump water through them. So these guys are kind of like the lungs of a coral reef. If you do not have an adequate supply of, of sponges to kind of clean the water, it'll get really mucky. So kind of seeing, well, a lot of these are filter feeders. Yes, even mollusca are. So all of these organisms play a vital role in the health of an ecosystem. Not all of them are marine. Obviously, you can have mollusk on land, but most of them started off that way. So in terms of sponges, when you look at them, I'm, lo I'm wanting you to see that their function is to actually pump water and to clean it, and that's why they're so important. All right, well, that brings us to the types of fossils of knowing what you're seeing if you're out in the field. Would you believe that this is a mollusk? This is called a rudist. So if you can imagine the shell, it had a little lid that went up and down like this. Kind of a cute little dude. It's an index fossil for late Cretaceous rock layers that were covered by the interior Cretaceous seaway. So this has been at the same time that T-Rex lived just out in the ocean. So we can have body fossils. These are things like my rudist here. They are either things like a bone, a tooth, a shell, feathers. Believe it or not, there are impressions and actual feathers that have been found, especially for dinosaurs, plant material, and any other part of the actual animal. So it has to be a part of the animal itself, not an excretion, not a leftover, like a footprint or something. It has to be the actual organism. So how can I tell this is body? Can you see that there's actual shell material? And if you touch this, it would feel like a shell, except it's much more durable. Besides body fossils, there are trace fossils. Trace fossils are very common, and they include evidence that the fossil was once in the neighborhood. So it lacks any actual body part, but it has a very clear indication that that fossil existed. So since you learned about ammonites and in phylum mollusca, they're cephalopods, right? This would have been where a cephalopod filled up the shell with sediment. And when it did, it the, the shell dissolved away, it broke away, and now you're left behind with the 3D internal uh, picture of what that animal looked like. So this would be like the shell over here being pushed into substrate, just like your foot if you were to step into something. This is called a mold. So there are lots of trace fossils. So uh, cast molds, tracks and trails, burrows, borings, coprolites, gastroliths. These are all examples. We'll learn more about them in a minute. So let's talk about tracks and trails. These are some of the most famous out there because like these are some massive dinosaur tracks right here and some of the longest in the world and these are actually some trilobite trails right here so tracks are footprints left behind in sediment how do they get preserved that's a great question how does anything like this get preserved usually burial pretty quick that didn't uh, dissolve or wash away the actual impression made so they're pretty special Trails are created by things like worms, snails, trilobites that move through sediments, or they can be something like a vertebrate or an animal that dragged something like a tail as they were walking. So tracks and trails are similar, but they do have a difference. Both leave an impression in sediment. Burrows and borings. So burrows, these are, this is from the uh, Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, 
And I want you to look at these things right here. If you've ever seen prairie dogs, then prairie dogs dig and they make these intricate little connected uh, catacombs for better lack of words and they go run and they jump and they come out and put their little heads up and then do their little thing like this and then they jump back in and they run back around well these burrows they've made have been preserved in the rock record so this is kind of a big burrow but we get worm burrows we get other types of burrowing at organisms like arthropods and sediments that we can actually see in the fossil record then there's borings so if you're saying, oh, it's boring like this class, all right, that's okay if you feel that way. But borings are not like boring like a class. They are borings like these circles and holes right here. So this poor little mollusk got attacked by something else. Likely it was looking for lunch. What I mean by that is the predatory organism got on top of the animal and literally drilled a hole. So I saw a starfish do this in person in the Bahamas. My dive master called us over and said, you got to watch this. So we were in very shallow water. And uh, so we dropped our gear and just had our mask and fins and snorkel on. And we watched the starfish walk. Hey, folks, man, I did not know starfish could get up and move like that. And this starfish spotted a mollusk, and it was dinner time for him. And he got on top of that thing and literally borrowed into it, literally made borings just like you see here, and then pried it open and ate the muscle right out of it. After it got done, it hopped off and scooted away. I have never been able to look at a starfish the same way since that day. So while they're cute, I was like, oh, and my whole paradigm of starfish was just ruined for life because of this traumatic experience of watching it attack a shell. So I'd seen these holes on shells before, but actually seeing it happen in modern day kind of gave me a new perspective of how it happens. So most of you have been or seen Baskin Robbins ice cream. This was a big part of my family growing up. And on their little logo, it says 31 flavors. Well, I kind of make the joke that copper lights are kind of like that. They're whatever excretions were left behind by organisms of vertebrates. So whatever they ate could be the flavor. So we get turtle poop here. And folks, this is pretty heavy. It's actually turned into an iron oxide. So it replaced the poo with iron over time. And if your uh, excretions weigh like this, I think we should talk. Uh, this is kind of like, it shouldn't be that way. And then there's this a cute little dinosaur poo. Now, what kind of dinosaur actually put it there? I have no idea. I know what the place is that said it was, but I don't buy off on it. My guess is it's just a small little... Uh, some type of a plant-eating organism. But coprolites really can be tested for what organisms ate, and they're typically found in close proximity to animals. One reason they're called a trace and not a body is we can't match them up to the animals that created them. It's not like you can say, okay, this fossil over here created this thing right here. Since we can't do that, they are all considered trace fossils. Gastroliths. These are kind of cool. So my dad did surgery on removing people's gallbladders and whatever they needed to have done surgically. And so we had, back in the day where you could still keep them, a collection of people's gallstones. I still have that collection. <laughs> That's kind of odd, I know, but how does it apply here? Well, some of them looked like these. Um, and they were in people's gallbladders, these, and sometimes you would get gallstones that came in all different colors. Well, gastroliths are kind of like gizzards. They are stones that are eaten by animals, either inadvertently or on purpose, to help and aid in digestion. So if you get, let's say, a predatory dinosaur, it might have consumed gastroliths that was from an animal like this, which was a non, it would have been an invertebrate that needed it to... <laughs> So maybe you got a dinosaur that was a predatory dinosaur and a Sorikian dinosaur. Specifically, let's just say something like a Coelophysis or a Tyrannosaurus rex, and it 
has some of these in there. Likely they ate something that was a dinosaur that uh, was not a predatory dinosaur that needed these to aid in the digestion. How do you know that these aren't just, you know, fake things if you try to buy them online? Typically, these stones are found with the fossils just like these are right here. So I'm going to tell you there are scams all over the place. Be careful. Lots of people are intrigued by gastroliths. They are very interesting and they tell a lot about an organism. But I would encourage you to know a little bit more about what you're purchasing online when it comes to fossils. And I would also ask the hard questions of where were these found? Were they legally collected with a permit? Because these trace fossils right here came from vertebrates. So that would actually fall under PERPA. And you need to be careful about that. Even tracks and trails, all of that stuff does. So just be careful and make sure you're asking the right questions. All right, very common and some of the most important trace fossils that we find out there because they're so prevalent are cast and molds. So I put what's the same kind of thing in your textbook. Um, I put a real fossil of an ammonite. This shows the individual cavities. This has been recrystallized here. But these little chambers, the oldest one's right here, and each chamber represents a period of growth. And this is just one side of the shelf, so it's been cut in half. And what will happen is uh, they use these animals when they're alive, use just a portion of the end to live in for the actual soft bodied animal and the rest is closed off for buoyancy control as they have to go up and down and sideways in water. So air and so forth fills up the rest of it. So this is the actual fossil. So that would be a body fossil. If this was pushed into the substrate, it would be this right here. So you can see, make out that same kind of pattern. That would be an impression or a mold. When this thing fills up with sediment and the fossils dissolved away, this is what we're left with is a 3D replica of the inside. That is the cast. So I know it's hard to get past that paradigm of cast like a cast on a broken arm, Cast are the inside sediment of the fossil like a, an ammonite here, while the 3D impression is called a mold. So make sure you get your terminology right. These are very common types of fossils that are trace. All right, so we have some challenges in preservation. Soft-bodied organisms like the ones you see over here are extremely rare. So there's a few fossil outcrops around the world. Uh, the Burgess Shale I mentioned in your chapter, this is actually some of those from the Burgess Shale are very, very uh, rare to get soft-bodied organisms. Let's say like worms. This is actually a, a relative of worms. So vertebrate fossils are also very difficult to preserve because of the time that there are much fewer of these alive and they likely were scavenged, uh, their body parts separated, disarticulated, um, weathered, moved by rivers, all the different challenges you could have. And then when you look at invertebrate fossils, most of them either live on land or water, especially those in water, if they get buried quickly they have a chance of being preserved. So that's why invertebrates are the most common thing in the fossil record with plants coming in number two. There are different ways we preserve fossils. There is what's called unaltered and then there's altered fossil preservation. What does that mean? We're really talking about body fossils here. There's occasion where I have seen trace fossils be altered, but when it comes to unaltered fossil preservation, we're only talking about body fossils. So fossils can be preserved when the organism retains its original composition, typically through a process of direct preservation. So it's taken a fossil that died and it's directly buried it, encompassed it, preserved it. Several ways this happens. In order of the most favorable specimens to study, we'll do one through four. Frozen fossils are by far the most sought after fossils we can find. That shouldn't be shocking news. We know things like DNA, biological samples, things of that nature are kept on ice and frozen so they won't decompose. Well, so when you find frozen fossils, that's a pretty big deal. Now let's just hit this head on for a second. The last ice age ended somewhere between 12,000 and 10,000 years ago when the Holocene actually started 10,000 years ago. 
when it comes to the frozen fossil record, it's very limited in age. So most of our frozen fossils are from the last ice age, which was something literally from about 2.6 million years ago to around 10 to 12,000 years ago. You might get lucky and find one that's older in Antarctica, where you have about 2 million years of ice. Beyond that, we do not have frozen fossils. I mean, we just don't. They're, the Earth has warmed up multiple times from climate change, and so our ice is record is very minimal. Desiccation would be something like drying out of a fossil, like a vertebrate fossil, so it mummifies, and uh, basically you get some of the soft tissue retained. One of the most famous desiccated fossils is Leonardo, and I'm not talking about the artist, I'm talking about the dinosaur. I actually did a dig with the paleontologist who discovered this fossil, and in the same area where he dug for the fossil, and I can tell you it's a big deal. Amber is like what you see in this picture. These little things right here are bugs. So in amber, the resin from trees and um, comes down, and it can capture small little things. You might even get an occasional vertebrate, but it'll be tiny. It'll be something like a lizard. I can remember playing in this when I was a kid in Houston because we had pine trees, and some of them were dying, and so they got lots of sap. And I was always intrigued by how much stuff got caught in there. I'd go out every day to try to free the animals, right, to rescue what I could. So amber can get small stuff. Asphalt and tar can capture full-size vertebrate animals as big as Columbian mammoths, which were the largest of the mammoth species. So these are unaltered fossil preservation types. Let's be just transparent. If you find something in these categories, they're very special. Most fossils are altered. So while I mentioned that it's super special to find an altered preservation, a majority of all fossils have been altered in their preservation. Case in point would be these petrified trees from the petrified forest. So you might wonder why they're broken into segments. Trees break along their tree rings, and this whole area was uplifted when the Colorado Plateau began to uplift, putting extreme stress on the petrified remains of these trees. And so they broke into these segmented pieces. They were not sawed that way. So any time that something like a plant, a tooth, an animal, a, a shell has been changed from its original composition, that's called altered fossil preservation. Let's take it a look a few ways. Probably the most common way to fossilize something is to turn it into stone. This is called permineralization. So permineralization occurs when the pores of bones, teeth, shells, and even plant matter. So this is the tree. Remember learning about this one earlier, and this is a jawbone of a mosasaur. Are permeated with mineral-enriched groundwater or river water, whatever it might be, usually groundwater, where the groundwater saturates these fossils that have been buried in rock layers. This is also the most common way that teeth are preserved. So this way retain the enamel, but teeth and bones actually get permineralized. So permineralization is actually uh, saturating these fossils into mineral enriched material, which turns them into stone. So how is that different from petrification? Petrification takes that a step further with plant material. So plant material literally goes through a full replacement where all the cellulose material is literally transformed. Now this is a really well petrified piece of wood that I purchased from a rock shop in Arizona out of the Chinle Formation. That's Triassic in age. However, I've collected legally, I might add, petrified wood from the same formation that's basically white, and it has not been very well petrified. It's still considered petrified wood, but it doesn't have these beautiful colors. So the minerals that make up the groundwater that saturates these logs is the key to petrification. Recrystallization is another type of altered fossil preservation. This type of preservation occurs when mineral solution alters the internal structure 
of like a shell or a bone or a plant and forms larger, more durable crystals. Very, 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 very common for shelly animals like our little palacipod here or bivalve. So I'm going to ask you for a test question. What's the most common way to preserve a shelly organism? This is it. Recrystallization. There are times, though, I have seen them replaced. Replacement. This is another type of altered preservation of fossils. This type of preservation occurs when the original skeletal, and that could be non-vertebrate, oftentimes it is non-vertebrate, material is replaced by the compound that was originally there by something completely different. This used to be a sand dollar, so the sand dollar now is pyritized, so it has made out of fool's gold now. So this could happen with iron, so remember me talking about the copper light that weighed so much? That would have been a replaced copper light with iron. Sometimes shells are replaced by a silica or a pyrite, so you have to look at them, and typically replaced fossils weigh a little bit more than they would if you would have just found them in nature without replacement. So a very special type of fossil preservation that's altered is called carbonization. This is how it works. Carbonization actually is where the organic material, the volatile organic compounds or whatever made this up, has decayed and left a film behind. So you really get this thing that's left behind that has some of the organic material there that's obviously been changed, but nevertheless, it's left behind the most minute detail. So you could have a philosophical discussion, is this a body or a trace fossil? For most people, they're going to call this a body fossil. And because there is evidence of the original animal there, or organism, or plant. But I can tell you it's probably not like something that's been preserved in unaltered category, like freezing, amber, desiccation, um, or asphalt tar pits. So these just get buried and quickly and then they just decompose and they leave behind this organic film that actually gets preserved in the rock. That's what carbonization is. Fossils tell stories. They're clues. They're clues and glimpses into environmental conditions to depositional environments. They are clues into the type of animals they might have been, and I'm going to use a trilobite as a case in point. So these are just four of the over 17,000 species of these things that existed over time, and each one of them is a little different, right? So you're like, okay, they kind of have the same body plan, you bet. Three parts. These dudes have eyes, this one probably does right here, but why does this dude have all this stuff hanging out? And why did this guy have some stuff right here? How, why did they have that? So that's a story right there is to understand the differences are probably about the way these animals lived. So when you find certain fossils in rock layers, they give you a clue as to what kind of environment they were. So if I found a trilobite, the first thing I would say is, hey, this is a marine environment. If I found an echinoderm, I would say the same thing. If I found a dinosaur fossil, I'd go, hmm, we're probably looking at a terrestrial environment. If I found a certain kind of plant that lived near a swamp, I could say, hey, this probably fossil represents a swamp environment. So it kind of gives us clues based on what we know about how organisms live today. The present is the key to the past philosophy then we can apply that to ancient organisms. So that brings us to death assemblages and living assemblages of fossils. So the very first videos I showed you at the beginning involved, you might remember this man right here, is my one of my favorite paleontologists in the entire world, and Axel's looking at the Redonda formation, as he would say, and he's looking at some fossils that some of our students have found and pointing out how we're going to get them out of rock. Now, here's the deal. These fossils were brought in to the Redonda formation at that's the time period. It was in the late Triassic 
And this is pretty much a river deposit. So all the fossils have been disarticulated. It's very rare you find something that's intact. And there's a hodgepodge of all this different stuff. So we find lots of fish scales. We find um, teeth from phytosaurs. And we find plates of adiosaurs and phytosaurs. Their armor plates. We find bones, maybe like an arm bone, a leg bone, or we find a brain casing. That's kind of a big deal. But you don't usually find the whole animal because they got separated after they died. So basically, a death assemblage is this. Fossils found in the same rock layer that were not associated with one another, but brought together after they died. And this area right here, this is a bunch of bryozoans, some brachiopods are in there, and what I'll call some clam clutter, where you just get a bunch of junk that all kind of ended up together after they died. While they might have lived in the same neighborhood, they're probably a death assemblage because they just are not the same. And so when we get into living fossil assemblages, things shift. Living fossil assemblages are super special and very rare. I'm going to tell you it's a lot more common to find death fossil assemblages. But the reason living assemblages of fossils are so spectacular is because they share a story about animals that live together. They were in the same geographic location, GPS location, and they all died together right in that location at the same time. So basically it tells a story about death and dying for a group where death assemblages tell us a death story about things that died and kind of got clustered together by whatever means possible. It doesn't tell the story of something that happened to a group of individuals in the same exact location. So at the Waco Mammoth National Monument, there are a series of Columbia mammoths and some other organisms that live in that or did live in that area. They were buried in a group of about three different rock layers that they've been able to determine over a period of probably about 40-ish thousand years. Why is that important? Well, there's a whole group of them <laughs> that they found. They, meaning some uh, scientists with the help of two young men who discovered what they thought were not cow bones but ended up being mammoth bones and they showed it to someone who was a vertebrate specialist a paleontologist who said I want to see where you found these these are kind of a big deal and that started the digging at what was known as the Waco mammoth site so multiple individuals we're talking not quite 20 but almost 20 were found in a group and even some babies were found in the tusk so that's kind of like a really big story there's a some hypotheses about how this happened. So inside the building, if you go to the, the site, there's actually a shelter built over some of the ones that are still on the ground that have not been extracted. The rest of the fossils are being housed at Baylor University right now uh, in a safe location, also temperature and climate controlled. So this building here is also temperature and climate controlled to keep the fossils from degrading. And you find an unidentified animal. They found a juvenile saber-toothed cat. And then here is one of my favorite mammoths that's there. It's called Mammoth W. Uh, whoever prepped her did a little bit too good a job because her teeth are too clean. They weren't able to actually extract some of the food particles to do some age dating and other types of cool tests. But another thing about these fossils is you can see they're together. See how these bones are together like the animal lived? That means it's articulated. So when you find a living assemblage of fossils, like, man, that's a big deal. And that's a story. And so there are groups of these across the world that have been found, whether it's mammoths, dinosaurs, whatever it might be. Living fossil assemblages are what every paleontologist wants to find because they are special, rare, and they tell remarkable stories. So that brings me to the articulated versus inarticulated. So this is Mammoth W again, and you can see how her fossils are together. Some of them have actually been split apart, like when her guts blew up when she died, kind of 
went like this and some of the ribs shot out in some directions but overall most of her stuff is all together that's articulated fossils so the bones are still pretty much together these are rare but when you find them they're a big deal right so what are disarticulated fossils they're fossils that are not together like these are teeth that we found uh, a friend of mine and the two of us found this big tooth it's one of the fangs of a phytosaur and this is Axel again and some of our students and they are jacketing a very important part of an animal that created these so these are a bunch of teeth and different bone fragments that were legally collected and they are just scattered in these rocks they're not articulated with the rest of the fossil so while they are vertebrates they certainly just are a random find so many Vertebrate fossils are this type of fossil. They're disarticulated. They are not with their uh, body parts. So if you found the entire skull of a phytosaur or a dinosaur and you found all its teeth, all its bones, wow, that would be better than museum quality. Every museum wants something like that. It's pretty special. So when you interpret fossils in rocks, I'm going to leave you with a story and then kind of sum it up at the end. The very first thing I'm going to tell you is leave stuff alone if it's on public lands, if it's not your land. And if even if it's on private land and you've been given permission, get it in writing. It will maybe save you a lawsuit. So this has happened in multiple cases where some of the most famous dinosaurs were found and people want those rights because they can actually generate substantial money. Not the case with these bones you see here. So it is disturbing to share with you that people I know extracted these bones illegally. And it all started with this. They saw this and they basically unearthed an entire mound of rock that they found it in. Extracted all of the material so you can kind of match up where these bones, which one of these this might be. And then took them away. So why is that so important besides it's illegal? Let's look at it from a scientific lens, not just from the legal and illegal lens. There was so much more of this animal in that ground, for sure. And now this has been removed and taken out of context. So what could have been one of the most remarkable fossil finds of late Jurassic dinosaurs was ruined by people who just wanted a trophy, who just wanted a piece of a dinosaur. What I'm asking you is, when you're interpreting fossils in rocks, I don't care if it's a trilobite, it's a, it's a bivalve, it's a dinosaur bone like this, it's a mammoth tooth, whatever it might be, you want to look big picture. That's why you want a real dinosaur dig with the right people, the qualified individuals, the right permits, because you're trying to add to the scientific value and knowledge of fossils that are out there for scientists. So do the right thing. Take a picture, <laughs> leave the fossils in their place, and try to get a permit so you can go back out there and do it and collect it properly because you might just end up being one of the most famous people who've ever extracted a fossil in your life if you find something like these. So understand when we're interpreting fossils, we need the whole picture. We need the depositional environment. You need to know about the rocks they were found in, the position that they were in, when you actually found them in the ground, among all the other legal stuff that you should have with it. As we conclude our lecture on fossils, I'm going to take you to one of the highest places in the South Island of New Zealand. And I share this because at the top of these mountains, you can find fossil evidence. Same thing with Mount Everest. And you need to realize that fossils are all over the place, but yet we have an incomplete fossil record. Value the fossils you find. Don't destroy them. Don't throw them away. Remember the scientific context that's important about our fossils. All right, let's take you to the Southern Alps. So you look at those mountaintops, could you imagine that there would be fossils there? And indeed there were. I'll see you back at the next lecture. Bye.